In my last tutorial, we explored how to make a really slick shockwave effect using SDFs, but there was a problem. As Nerd Medley pointed out, seven months ago? <laughs> how did that happen? I have been busy in that time, mostly working on my game Star Mining Co. I streamed a lot of the development, by the way, in case you're interested. It's super close to being done, but I'll have more updates on that in the future. Anyway, as Nerd Medley pointed out, you could only have a single shockwave at a time, which is a bit of a bummer. They asked if there was a way of handling multiple waves, so that's what we're going to do in this video. And the steps we'll be doing today don't just apply specifically to this shockwave effect, they can be used more generally on all sorts of shader effects. Now, this should go without saying, but we'll be building on the code from the original video. So if you haven't watched it, I'd highly recommend doing that and then coming back to this video, just so you've got a better idea of what's going on. As a little refresher though, we've got a bit of JavaScript running p5.js, which keeps track of where the mouse has been clicked on the screen and starts running a timer after each click. This lets us know where the shockwave is and how far through the animation we are. The JavaScript then passes this information as uniforms into our fragment shader, which uses this information to create an SDF of a circle or any other shape, which it then uses to generate displacements when we're sampling from the background image and bam, there's your shockwave. To get multiple shockwaves going, we're gonna have to pass more information into the shader. To get us heading down the right track, the first thing we'll do is change the types of the uniforms we're passing into the fragment shader. Each instance of a shockwave needs to know the location of its center as well as how far through the animation we are. We're currently passing in a vector 2 for the center location and a float for the time, but this is obviously only enough information for a single shockwave, so let's turn them both into arrays. In GLSL, you can't have a dynamic array, so we have to give these a length. I've created a constant variable for the maximum number of shockwaves and set it to 10. You can obviously change this to however many you'd like, but just keep in mind that adding more will have an impact on performance. We'll come back to the fragment shader in just a moment, but first let's make sure we're passing the appropriate data from the JavaScript into these new uniforms. In the JavaScript, let's get rid of the old T variable and create two new arrays, one called centers and one called times. I'm sure you can figure out what they'll both be used for. Since the GLSL arrays are a fixed size, we'll need to match that here. I've mirrored the constant from the fragment shader and set the number of shockwaves to 10, and we can use that to initialize our arrays. By the way, if you'd like to follow along, I've linked the code for the original as well as this new version in the description, and you can edit and run it in your browser. I'm able to keep all of these resources freely available to everyone thanks to the generosity of my lovely members, including our one and only legend member, Tom Kirby Green, as well as the wonderful people who leave a super thanks donation. I cannot thank you enough. If you'd like to help support these videos and become a legend, click the join button below. So we've got these new arrays, but we're not putting anything in them yet. At the end of the setup function, let's add a for loop that goes over each shockwave and sets some default values. For the centers, we can put them all at zero, zero, and we'll just set the time to one, indicating that the animation is completed. This way we won't get a bunch of shockwaves all appearing at once when we start up. At the moment, the way we set the center of the shockwave is by directly setting the uniform from the set center to mouse function, but we can't do that anymore since we're using an array to keep track of all of our information. We'll get to setting the uniforms in a moment, but first we need to actually update the data in our arrays. Each time we click the mouse, we want to add the click location to the centers array and add a new timer starting at zero to the times array. If we just append this information, our arrays will have grown in size, but remember, GLSL can't handle dynamic array sizes, so this new information will just be left out. So what we need to do is remove the first element of the array, then add our new data to the back. This way we create a sort of conveyor belt where each time we add a new shockwave, the oldest one gets deleted. To do this in the JavaScript, we can use the handy shift function to remove the first element. All right, so we've got our arrays initialized and they update with the new shockwave information each time we click the mouse and we make sure that our array always stays the same size, making it compatible with the GLSL. Now we need to actually feed all this information into the shader. Currently in the draw function, we simply set each of the uniforms and then draw a rectangle to trigger our shader. But our new array based information needs a bit of pre-processing before we can pass it into the shader. If you recall from the original, the JavaScript timer is linear, but we were applying some easing to it before sending it into the shader to give the animation a bit more character. We'll have to do the same calculation to each timer in our array before sending it in. The other thing to be aware of is how we pass an array of vectors into the shader. 
The shader is expecting all the values in a single long array with each pair of values, and pair in this case since we're using a vector two, corresponding to a single vector. At the moment, our centers array is an array of arrays, so we'll have to format this as well. Let's create two new arrays called centers uniform and times uniform, which will hold the formatted data, then loop over all of our shockwaves. The first thing we wanna do is make sure that our timers are getting updated. Then we can concatenate each pair of center values into the centers uniform, which will create the single long array that we need, and we can push the eased time values into the times uniform. Once we've looped through all the shockwaves, we can then simply call set uniform for both the centers and the time arrays. Now all of our shockwave data is being sent to the GPU, but it's still only set up to handle one shockwave, so let's go back to the fragment shader to get it working with multiple at once. Thankfully we've done most of the hard work for this already in the original video. We basically just need to encapsulate our shockwave calculations in a loop so that we can handle each shockwave individually. If you remember back to the original video, we use the direction of the current pixel to the center of the shockwave to calculate an offset. We use that offset to sample the background image at a slightly different location to create the warping effect. What we'll need to do is sum up these offsets so we know the total offsets from all the shockwaves. We'll also need to sum up the direction from each shockwave so that our offsets are being applied in the correct direction. To do this in the fragment shader, let's create a total direction vector two and a total offsets vector three. The offsets will get a vector three because we added some chromatic aberration in the original effect, so we've got a different amount of offset for the red, green, and blue channels. Next, we can wrap everything that comes before the texture sampling in a for loop that goes over each shockwave. Since we no longer have our original center and T uniforms, we can set those as variables to use the current shockwave in the loop and do our calculations exactly the same as before. After the shockwave calculations are finished, we can add the direction into the total direction vector and add the three color channel offsets into the total offsets vector. Our summed vectors now hold the total direction and offsets from all the shockwaves, so we can update our texture sampling to use these values instead of the original uniforms, and just like that, our shader can handle multiple shockwaves. But you might see that there's a bit of a problem. The shockwaves are looking really fuzzy, and that's because we're adding the directions of all the shockwaves, regardless of whether that shockwave is influencing a pixel or not. Thankfully, this is a super simple fix. If a shockwave isn't producing any offset, we can just exclude it from the totals. The easiest way to do this is by using the step function. We can store this information in a variable called influence, which should be zero if there's no offset and otherwise be a one. By the way, we're using the green offset since it isn't affected by the chromatic aberration. We can then multiply our direction and offset vectors by this influence variable before adding them to the totals so that any shockwave with no influence gets canceled out. If we run this again now, you can see that we get multiple clean shockwaves. I really hope that this video has answered your questions, Nerd Melody, and I hope it's been helpful for everyone else as well. Like I said earlier, the code is linked in the description so you can play around with it and modify it for your own needs. If you've got any questions at all, please just ask away in the comments or better yet on the Discord server. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you again soon.